you have to use the table of contents to find out what book he might be in. What book are you going to be in, Jeff? Exodus. Genesis, Exodus. Thank you. You made that easy for us. Come on up, Jeff, and share with us. Before Jeff does, I want you to know at the in the lobby, come on up, Jeff. In the lobby, he's brought a lot of free literature that you can take, put this on your refrigerator, pray for he and his family, their ministry. Jeff is a member of one of our sister churches, Hillside Baptist Church. Yes. And you know, I can almost walk to that church from where I live. So I'll come visit you sometime. Okay. Let's pray for our time as we listen to God's word. Father, thank you how you have used Jeff today, but through the years, and how I pray you'll bless and continue to use him in the future as he shares the glorious message of you, our Messiah, Jesus. Thank you. Bless his life. Bless his health. Thank you for a wonderful family. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Let's just stay at that slide. Um, we're going to do this uh, analog. So I'm going to just, I'm going to use click. I'm very verbal. Uh, and so if I raise my finger, I feel like I'm in an auction. So we're, we're not going to do the raise finger thing. So I'll just say click and, and that'll let everyone know. Uh, you don't have to go far. You're going to be in Exodus. You're going to be in chapter 3. Um, so you can just go there if you have your Bibles. If you have your, your cell phones, uh, it's even easier to turn the pages. So you're all set. I'm seeing how many people got that. Um, because it's a different sort of world we live in. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to go click. Whoops, we don't want him to play again. That's uh, Dr. Marcus Welby. Uh, TV and radio and movies are the stories of our culture. I grew up as a fairly nerdy type kid who'd come home and watch TV. Uh, had some of the early Marvel comic books which got lost in my dad's garage that would have helped our support level greatly if I had held on to those. Um, and so... Um, Long ago, doctors used to make house calls, didn't they? In Dr. Welby's day, they did. And so we're going to talk about the God who makes house calls. Now, I'm into the big story. And for me, one of the biggest things as a Jewish guy was to discover that this was all part of a big narrative and to discover that the New Testament actually fit with the Old uh, when I was growing up, the front part of your Bible, those first books, which you call the Old Testament, I never would have called them that. I would have called them the Tanakh or the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, that was our book. And then you guys had the New Testament. That was your book. And I remember as a, being, uh, as, as a kid being really angry that you got your book and our book too. I somehow didn't think that was very fair. And then one day I discovered that, that actually the books are, are both part of one story. So we're going to go back to that slide that was there. We're going to skip Dr. Marcus Welby. There we are. And we're going to look at how this fits together. Uh, the first five books of your Bible are called the Torah in Hebrew. That's what I grew up with them being called, the Torah. The Torah doesn't mean law in Hebrew. The Torah comes from the Hebrew word yareh, which means to throw. And the idea is, you know how young people say, I'm throwing it out there? Well, that's like the biblical, I'm throwing it out there. And so the word Torah means instruction. And so Jewish people never looked at the Bible as just a rule book. They looked at those five books as, as all instruction. Everything was instruction. 
And so we're going to take a few minutes here. When Israel was in Egypt and they got back out, God had to sort of re-reveal himself to them. They had the stories probably passed down, but we're talking about 400 years in Egypt. Okay? Exodus really explained to Israel how, where they came from. Where did we come from? How did this all start? And so that's what Exodus does. It, I mean, uh, Genesis does. It takes us from the creation uh, through to Joseph. How, how did we get to be a people? How did we start? Where did we come from? Where did everything come from? That's Genesis. Uh, not as in favor with certain groups these days. Um, Leviticus was about how the priests ended up doing what they're supposed to be doing. It was a manual for the priest. When you're reading Leviticus, you're reading how to be an Old Testament priest 101. That's what that was really about. Numbers was how do we get to the promised land because they blew it. Uh, In fact, I jokingly say that your book of Numbers is because Israel didn't get it right between uh, essentially Exodus and Deuteronomy. Now they're all set to get to the land. But Moses told he wouldn't He was told he wouldn't enter the land. So now we've got a problem. These people have to be prepared to enter the land. Hey, they blew it once, and it was 40 years. This could be really destructive. And so uh, Deuteronomy actually comes from two words, which means the second law. And it's a reiteration. It's Moses giving his last instructions before he passes away. I do have to warn you, the end of Deuteronomy wasn't written by Moses because he's dead. Dead people don't write well. So probably Joshua had to finish the part with the death of Moses because Moses wasn't there to do it. Uh, But that's what Deuteronomy is there. So what's Exodus there for? Exodus is how did we become a theocratic nation? These guys enter Egypt as a bunch of tribes that don't even like each other. Boy, you want to talk about dysfunctional family? I jokingly say Jewish dysfunctional families are natural. We started as a dysfunctional family, and we continue to have dysfunctional families. Um, And so, um, basically, you had these brothers. You know, I grew up with musicals. My dad's parents were opera. They came from Eastern Europe. My dad's thing was musicals, because he didn't know Italian, and he didn't want to learn it, and he didn't know much German, and he didn't want to learn it. So he listened to musicals, and he took us to musicals. And I remember seeing... Camelot in the round as seven brides for seven brothers and my kids grew up with musicals and really you know the the brothers beating each other up and seven brides for seven that's like the tribes of Israel you know rough and tumble and so they go in there and what they do is they emerge as a people which is what they were supposed to be and they're given information on how to worship as a theocratic nation, and that's Exodus. So now you've got the picture of the five books and how they fit together. We're going to be getting into um, Exodus chapter 3, okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about backgrounds. A story needs a background. We did a little bit here. Um, 400 years in captivity in a pagan environment. I mean, we can't even imagine what that would look like, right? Most of us. Most of us who, who grew up in America. For those dear brothers and sisters from another background, I'm so glad you're here. We can both be from another background together. It's so exciting. Um, that may be a little different. But, you know, most of the folks that, that, you know, do the 4th of July and have been doing it for a long time, we can't even imagine what that looked like. And in the ancient world, it worked like this. If I beat you in battle, my God is greater than your God. That's the way it worked. So the Israelites are in Egypt for 400 years. And the Egyptians are turning to them regularly and saying, Oh yeah, that invisible God you follow? Like Horus and Ra beat him. Where's your God? Where's your God? He's left you for 400 years. Where is he? Has he gone to sleep? Is he not aware of your plight? We win, you lose. And that's 400 years of that. And that's all they're surrounded by is paganism. Why did God allow that to happen? Let's go click. I want to show you the mercy of our God. 
Abraham's being talked to by God, and he says, Know for certain your disciples will be strangers in a land not theirs, and they will serve them, and I will afflict, and they will afflict them 400 years, and also the nation whom they serve I will judge, and after they come, and afterwards they will come out. And then the next verse after that says, For the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Isn't that funny? God let Israel be in slavery for 400 years because he was giving the Canaanites a chance to repent. When I get bothered by people who complain about the biblical wars, I tell them that God never, ever judged and exterminated a society that he did not give time to repent to that society to. But that's not the way Israel sees it. They've long forgotten these words. They remember the promises, but they probably don't remember this information. And so they're wondering what's going on. Now, my preaching professor said, you will give people a take-home truth, or you will flunk my preaching class. If people fall asleep, they need a one- or two-sentence thing they can take home with them so that they will get something out of the message. And you can go click, because the take-home truth will be available to you. God sends those he calls. If you get nothing out of it other this morning than that, you have gotten something worthwhile. God sends those he calls. You can go click. Now we're going to get into the text. This happened as part of a Hebrew project when I was in seminary. Professor Glazer said, I want you to look at the text of Exodus 3. And I started looking in the text. And you know the way I do Bible study? I ask God questions. I look at the text, I start asking questions. Why is this here? Why is this worded here? Why is this in this order? What's being said here? How does it fit in the story? And God's good because he answers good questions. And so I pulled out the Hebrew, and I'm staring at the Hebrew text. I said, wait a minute. I can see where different parts of this fit together. And I started outlining this and diagramming this in the Hebrew, and I went back to Dr. Glazer, and I said, you wouldn't believe what I found. I could prepare a whole message on this from the Hebrew. And she said, good, you're up for chapel next week. You will be speaking. <laughs> okay, I just made more work for myself, right? And that's what this came out of. So we're starting in verses 1 and 2. Let's get a principle out of there. The principle's already listed. Now Moses was tending the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush, and so he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Let me start there. Now the funny stuff up there is what Hebrew looks like. If I do nothing else, you're going to go, oh, that's what Hebrew looks like. Uh, and I do that with Greek and Hebrew um, because there's, there's some neat things there. Okay, When it says that Moses was tending his flock in the Hebrew, that's what we call an ing word. You call it a participle. Okay? An ing word. He was going. He was doing. We use those words to indicate continuous action. And in the Hebrew, they're even more important because there's no such thing as a present tense in the Hebrew. Hebrew has complete tense, it's done, or it will be done, incomplete. Perfect and imperfect. So how do you say something's going on in Hebrew? Where well, there are different ways of doing that. One of the ways you do that is you make an ing word. You do a participle. So Moses was tending, present tense continuous action, the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. What does that tell me? That tells me he was going about his daily business. He was waking up in the morning and he was doing what he always did. He was tending participle, the, the, flo the flock of Jethro. In other words, when Moses got up that day, it was just another day. Today's Tuesday. I go out, I tend the flock of my father-in-law. Every single day. It was a day like every other when he got up and opened his eyes. I want you to kind of get a feel for that. And while he's doing that, he's leading the flock, doing what he's always doing, and he came to Mount Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appears, and there was a burning, a bush burning, but it was not consumed. Now what I want you to get is who interrupted Moses' life that morning? God did. 
The first principle is that God interrupts our lives for his purposes. Do you like interruptions? I don't like interruptions. I'm methodical. I'm consistent. I like regularity. I don't like surprises. Marlene used to do this. She'd say, let's go for a ride. I'd say, where was she going? She'd say, for a ride. I said, where are we going? She said, for a ride. I said, I don't get it. There has to be a destination. There has to be a plan. We still struggle with that. She's more spontaneous than, than my little personality likes. God interrupts. And we have to be kind of prepared for that a little. The phone call I didn't want when I was working on the message may be the phone call I have to take. The thing I have to put other things aside for to get done may be the thing I need to do that doesn't set well. It's interesting. A methodical guy handling apologetics questions on the street is one giant ad lib. And yet it's what I do. God interrupts our lives. Be ready. The interruption may be the mission. The interruption may be the thing. The interruption may lead to the thing that you're supposed to do. That's principle one. I'm going to go click. Now let's see what goes on as we go through this, okay? He's been interrupted. The bush is burning. It's not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see the great sight, why the bush does not burn. He didn't say why it wasn't on fire. He said why it didn't burn. So this is unusual. And Moses' curiosity is aroused. I see a bush and it's not doing what it ought to be doing. Now the idea of a bush catching fire in the desert is not a big thing. I mean, that happens in Arizona. Right? But how many trees start on fire and they're not consumed? How often do you see that sort of thing? So this is unusual. I love this. When, God, when the Lord saw that he had turned aside, God's paying attention and sees that Moses has turned aside. Who set Moses up to be curious? God did. When God sees that Moses had turned aside, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Does God stutter? Why in the world? Because in the Hebrew, anything repeated is emphatic. God is getting Moses' intention by using an emphatic form in the Hebrew. Moses, 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 pay attention. And he said one word in Hebrew. It's three in English. Hineni. I love that word, Hineni. It's like reporting for duty in Hebrew. Hineni. I am here. Now, we're going to see kind of what's interesting here because what we saw was the angel of the Lord in verse 2, and we see God's calling Moses. You need to understand something. Jewish people do not, are not raised Trinitarian. If I gave you my testimony, one of the biggest obstacles to coming to faith for me was the Trinity. And it's also one of the glorious parts of my testimony because God began to show me evidence for the Trinity from the Old Testament. Do you know I could defend the Trinity better from the Old Testament than from the New? From the foundations. And so here's one of these places. The angel of the Lord is God. And what's so cool about this is in Jesus' day when they were having theological discussions, you know one of the things they were discussing? How does a transcendent God interact with his creation? How does the God who's out there be here? And Judaism was questioning that. And we have these answers where God invades his creation, and this is one of those places And so the angel of the Lord ends up talking to Moses. And he says, Do not draw near to this place. Take off your sandals, off your feet. That's where sandals would be. For the place where you stand is holy ground. You know what I tell people? Dirt is dirt unless God's there. Dirt is dirt unless God's there. What makes that sacred ground isn't that Mount Horeb had a special colored dust 
or sand on it. What made it was holy was God was there. Anywhere God is, is holy because he is present. And a clump of dirt on a mountain in the middle of the wilderness that looked like someplace outside of Phoenix becomes holy because God is there. And that made it holy. And he tells Moses who he is. Don't miss it. Now I'm going to make sure my slides keep up. Um, okay. He tells Moses who he is. Now we can go to the next slide because I'm going to double back a little bit. It's exegetical with a little bit of jumping for context, okay? But I want to kind of make a point here. Who is he? Now remember what the Egyptians are saying. Where's your God? I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. Do you know that's used in the Jewish prayer book over and over again? Jews have a prayer book. Now you can do your own prayers if you can find the time. Because the prayer book's quite extensive. But the idea was we're scattered all over the world. How are we going to say anything the same thing? How are we going to remember anything? Oh, I know. We'll remember through having prayers that the people enter into together so we can corporately pray and we can remember stuff. And so it was like a memory device. It was a th like a theological way to, incult, uh, to, to pass theology on. Um, we do it through hymns sometimes. Oh, I love it. Some of the old hymns. Great is thy faithfulness. See, really you don't know, but you got a theology lesson when you sang that hymn. See, that the songwriter wants you to remember the theology, and so he put it in the music, and you sing it, and you walk home, and you say, great is thy faithfulness, and what you're really doing is you're rehearsing an attribute of God. And so God says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You know the God of your people's history. I am the God of the promise. I am the God who transcends generations. I was with Abraham. I was with Isaac. I was with Jacob. And so to this day, Jews will pray, Elohe Avraham, Velohe Yitzhak, Velohe Yaakov, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm that deity. That's who I am. I like to tell people theology is easy. God acts on who he is and what he said. Theology 101. And there he is. Now, would he have been saying that if Moses had not turned aside to investigate? No. Now, God knew he was going to. God made sure he did. I'm not debating that. I'm debating that God used Moses' response. That's all I'm saying. We ask people to respond. You're going to be asked to respond today. This is a Southern Baptist church. I can ask people to respond to a message, right? Okay. You know what Brian does? He says, this is your charge for the week. And he puts a thing up. We are always asked to respond. Our, our music guy, um, Jim, he says, worship is responding to who God is and what he's done. Any act that does that is worship. And so Moses responded, and we need to realize that there's good material out there. Do we have a mystery? God's sovereign, absolutely. Do human beings have to respond? Absolutely. How does it work? I know both is true, and I refuse to give up either theological truth. I won't do it. I won't choose between truths in the Bible as if I was cherry-picking. Men must respond. When I tell people they need to accept Jesus, when I tell Jewish people that he's the Messiah, he's their rightful king, and they need to respond, they need to respond. There needs to be a human response. And Moses did that. So, let's go here. God has drawn Moses through an unusual thing. Moses' day has been interrupted. Boy, does he have a story to tell his wife, Sapporo when he comes home, right? What a day, dear. He turns aside. He sees this. God speaks to him. Uh, we need to go click on the other slide up there. Our slide's in. good. He has called Moses. Did he say, hey, you? No. It's emphatic. It's personal. Did God call you personally? That's a good answer. If you're in Jesus Christ, God called you personally. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't just draw a circle and a giant magnet and suck some people out of the crowd and say, oh, you happen to be one of them. Oh, I'm so glad you joined. This is this amorphous group of people and you just happen to be there. No, this is a personal thing. 
If you're here and you know Jesus Christ, it's because God personally called you. If you're here and you're hearing this and you don't know him, God is personally calling you this morning. Get the message? If you don't know him, this is your burning bush. You just arrived. It's by name. I love that. It's personal. It's emphatic. Our God is not a God way out there who does not interact with people. He is a God who interacts with history. He invades lives. He invades history. I remember a book by Johnny Erickson Tata called The Glorious Intruder. I love the title. He intrudes. He intrudes in our world. He intrudes in life. And he is interested in intruding. But he's the intruder you want to intrude. So let's keep moving from there. By the way, Moses' response is absolutely proper. Okay? Absolutely proper. In the presence of God, we must respond properly. So he does what he should do. He was afraid to look. Isn't it amazing? We have a God who so loves us, and yet we're encouraged to be afraid to look at him. Well, in a sense, we've been allowed to look at him in the face of Jesus, right? But he was too much to take in. The finite mind just can't do it. I spend my time loving truth and defending it and, and using reasoning. And I love sweet reason, but you know there's a place reason can't take you. And there's a reason that that's true, because God is so much bigger than I am. I had a Jehovah's Witness once object to the Trinity. He said, I can't understand it. And I said, a God who I could understand would be too stupid to worship because he'd have my IQ. There's a place we can't go. And so Moses kind of knows that. What's Moses' question? Now God answers it. I love it. God answers questions of the heart. What's Moses' question? Where have you been? Where have you been? Your people have been in slavery for 400 years. I ended up having to run away from Pharaoh after I tried to do it my way, by the way. That was the, the killing of the Egyptian was the Frank Sinatra attempt of Moses. Okay, I did it my way. It didn't work. And he's thinking, wait a minute. You could have snapped your fingers and this could have been taken care of. You could have said the word and it all would have ended where have you been? And the Lord said, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. I know their sorrows. That's so powerful. God hadn't done something they could see yet, but God was aware of their sorrows. That's something we need to keep in mind. That's something we need to be able to relate to people. The hurting person needs to know that Jesus can handle their sorrows. That's where we start with someone who's hurting. My dad used to ask, why was God doing when the six million, that's why I've spent so much time with the problem of evil, and I love discussing the problem of evil apologetically. Where was our God when six million Jews died? My answer was weeping. That's the answer. And that's the answer he needed to hear. He didn't need a theodicy. He needed an existential answer. That's a big word, meaning he needed to be able to put it into real experience. What am I going to do about this? Verse 8, I've come down to deliver them. Ah, perfect. God's going to snap his fingers. It's going to be over and bring them to the land, to a land good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites. So I'm all set. God's going to take care of it now. Moses could have said, time to go back, take care of the sheep. Perfect. It's all done. I mean, I can catch up with my relatives when they're all freed. Wouldn't that be nice? That's not the way God's going to do it. Verse 
So, now behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I've seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppressed them. Good. We covered that, right? Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, wait a minute now. It was fun before. You were going to snap your fingers. I didn't have to do anything. No, I've got a mission for you, Moses. It's going to define the rest of your life. I will send you to Pharaoh, and you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. (laughs) And Moses is thinking, you've got to be kidding. (laughs) Been there, tried that, done that, killed the Egyptian guy, ran away, got lost, ended up getting a home. Now I have a family, a wife, and you're going to send me where? The Chicago kid who went to Vermont, ah, behold, I'm going to send you to Arizona. What? Wow. Wow. And you're going to bring these people out, Moses is thinking. Uh, me and what army? In fact, he's going to object. Now, here's the thing. You're sent. We're going to talk about this a little more. But I, I want to get you a sense of what that you're sent means. Because God didn't need Moses to get it done. God chose Moses to get it done. So Moses is going to put up his objections, okay? Oh, he's got a list of them already set, okay? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and I should bring out the children of Israel? Not not me. I'm not really equipped for this. You ever had that feeling? You're not equipped for this? Okay? Any guy who's been in the ministry feels at times he's not equipped for it, okay? I'm not equipped for this. Uh, No, I don't think so. I have an answer to your lack of equipping, Moses. I'll be with you. See, I'll fill in your gaps. I'll get it done. So we have to end up moving. Moses makes a bunch of other excuses. I don't talk well. I got to tell you, I'm finishing a dissertation. I don't write well. I need like six more software solutions. You get it done because God told you to get it done. And so you're sent. Now, if you want a verse, John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Could God have done it without Moses? Yeah. Did God decide he didn't want to do it without Moses? Yeah. Could God save those he wants to save without you? Yeah. Did he decide he's not going to without you? Yeah. Bottom line, God wants to use people. Maybe better ways, but it isn't what he's decided. You all have a task. Okay, I don't know what it looks like for you. I don't know what your days are going to be interrupted with. I don't know how it's going to play out. I don't know how it's been playing out because you've been in it. You've been walking it out, some of you. Some of you longer than others. I'm starting to get the, you know. I just had my birthday yesterday. I turned 57, so I'm, I'm, you know, I feel it more. You know, you're walking it out. You all have the purpose. Ah, but I don't know how. I'm scared to share. Look, you all have a story. There's a hymn that says, I love to tell the story, right? Right? You don't have to come equipped with any more than your testimony to have a story. You're all carrying a gospel track called My Testimony. And if you have nothing else on you, you have that. And by the way, more than one Jewish person has met a Gentile who has told them what Jesus has done and then relate it to them. Cecil Rosen, Moish Rosen's wife, who founded Jews for Jesus, got saved because she saw O Come, O Come, Emmanuel being sung and danced as part of a Christmas program. Do not underestimate the creativity of our God to use what is in your hand. And so the Great Commission is given, and we all have a gospel track. So what does a week look like in the life of Jeff Cran? Well, if you stick the word normal, you've already lost. 
It's different. It's the question I hate being asked as a missionary. What does a week look like? It looks exactly like God's supposed to have it look like if I'm doing it right. And if I'm doing it wrong, it doesn't. But I do want to let you know some of what we do. So I'm going to go to the click. And as I do that, you all receive slips. Now I want to tell you where we're at now. Um, We are faith-supported missionaries. Now you guys already have Amy Armstrong and Lottie Moon. I know that. Those, are, those were the two newest words I had to learn when I joined the Southern Baptist was Amy Armstrong and Lottie. Those were the two names I had to learn. Because before I was a Southern Baptist, is Lottie who? And Amy what? And so I had to learn about that. And I don't want to mess. We're not part of the cooperative program. But we're still looking for people to partner with us. And one of the nice things about the Southern Baptist is you have a certain amount of freedom. So you have slips. I need those filled out and turned back in. I want to partner with you any way you can. Now, does anyone not have a slip in the bulletin? Because some people didn't take bulletins. Which means you didn't know what was going on this morning. If you don't have a slip, um, my wife can give you a slip. Um, Chosen People's been doing the slip presentation for almost 100 years. But we didn't have perforation. That's like the newest invention. So it's really cool. We've invented perforation. It's exciting. You get to keep my testimony. Fill that out. We need to collect those. If pastor can make sure they're collected, I turn them in. No postage to you. They've got the secret code. Ah, my initials and a code after it. And I need to turn those in. That says, one, you were here. Two, we all had fun this morning hearing the word. I want them to know that. I always like the, 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 um, the headquarters to know that Arizona's on the map. So I'm putting you guys on our map right now. Okay? Um, and take the opportunity. We're getting, we lost somewhere between 50 and 70% of our support. It's getting better. Um, dear lovely brothers and sisters, but what we were doing wasn't part of what they wanted. So they kind of said bye. And we kind of said, okay. You need to be who you are. And that was a long time ago, and so we lost a lot of supporting churches with that group. Um, but that just gives God the opportunity to do big things and reconstruct everything. So that's kind of exciting. While you're doing that, I told the Sunday school class that, that my mission is to make much of Messiah through God's big story. It's good to have a purpose statement. Figure out what yours are. I'm going to go click. I'm going to show you some pictures of what we do. See the smiling guy with the deer antlers? Actually, he stood in front of a tree. When we took the picture, the antlers showed up. And I got all sorts of Facebook things about how the worship leader at Hillside has grown horns. (laughs) Poor Jim. That's Jim Hurlbert. He's come out and done some music for me when I've done First Fridays. And that was one of the nights. Now, he's got other pastoral duties, so he can't always hang out with me. But we had a wonderful time. Uh, And if he can figure out application, he'd probably be there a little more. But we need to save his voice for for Sunday. That's him. That's me on Venice Beach. Yes, I took the Isaiah 53 table, which is one of the main ways I end up sharing with people. And I took it to Venice Beach because I had a friend that said, I want to tape some of your teachings. Would you come out to Venice Beach and share? And I said, yes, I will set up a a table on Venice Beach and we had Stump the Theologian and a few people came. A few people came after they had one too many marmosas, which leads to interesting theology. Uh, That's me in front of a regular Isaiah 53 table. That's some of what I do. Uh, I do some things other chosen people missionaries don't do. And I want to tell you about one of them and I want to encourage you. In fact, I'm going to pull it out in a minute here. I did save it. Good. Um, met a dear Syrian Christian brother. He heard me speak. He said, wait a minute. I hear the same objections from the Muslims that I do from the Jews. Would you go tell Muslims? Would you tell a Muslim that Jesus is the fulfillment of the burning bush? Would you tell a Muslim that they need the Lamb of God just as Abraham's son was substituted by for a lamb? Would you tell a Muslim that? I said, yeah. He said, good. You're coming out to Dearborn, Michigan. You're, you're going out, and I want you to share what you'd share story-wise with the Jewish people and lay the gospel out as a story like you do with them. I would like them to hear that. 
So he is my dear friend, George Saig. Now you've got to see what this is. This is a Jewish guy hanging out with a Syrian Christian in front of a mosque. God's got a sense of humor. Here I am, send somebody else. And so we did a little of that. We went out to Dearborn, Michigan. My wife ended up doing henna outreach. She can explain that later. That's, that's how to reach woman Muslims without the guys around, because that's a big thing. Uh, my daughter cut the hair of Muslim women and then ended up having someone share the gospel with them. And so we went to Dearborn. Well, we're doing a conference that we did last year. We're doing it again. You can go ahead. Um, This kind of ties into your charge, so I'm going to give you application, but I want to let you know that your sister church, Hillside, is putting this on for the second year. I actually was able to coordinate with George and help put this on for Hillside. Now look, you know, I'm going to joke more about this later, but if a crazy Jewish guy who believes in Jesus can stand in front of a mosque and explain the story of Isaac's, Isaac's binding to a bunch of Muslims, anybody can. So I'm still here, and you can be too. And so I like to get people to come back, live to tell the story, and encourage their brother, uh, other folks. And the reality is I would rather be around a bunch of Arabic believers in Jesus than I would be in front of a bunch of jih jihadist Muslims. I got a much better chance with the brothers. <laughs> and so um, that's coming up. Um, the Friday night, I will be teaching on the insider movement and Islam, what we can't sacrifice doctrinally. Uh, there's a North African dinner involved. There's limited space. There's only so much North African food in Phoenix, and we have to grab it all. So um, there's contact info, but George will need to know. The morning is a teaching session on answering Islam, and then George is going to do I'm going to do answering Islamic objections. He's going to do answering Islam. Um, we're going to be at the Denny's, and then we're going to go out and share the Arab American Festival and Mosque Evangelism. Is this what Jew, Jew, uh, chosen people usually does? No, but they have the same objections. Why shouldn't I? And so that's why that's there. Okay, I need to give you a charge. I need to give you a charge after I get this to go. There we go. You can just go click. I've been following the phone, Okay. Here's the charge. Tell someone about Jesus or share your testimony. Folks, you're called. You're sent. This morning, hopefully, you've been better equipped. Go. There's the mission field right outside the doors. Get to it. Engage in outreach. I don't care what kind it is. I knew a girl in college. She had the cookie ministry. She was a shy girl. She used to walk around the dorms Bake chocolate chip cookies, offer them to the students. Hey, look, when you're ready to have the munchies when you're studying, you will take chocolate chip cookies. They'd say, why are you giving me chocolate chip cookies? She'd say, let me tell you about the love of God that prompted me to give chocolate chip cookies. I thought, this is never going to work. She led more people to the Lord than I did. I don't know what she put in the chocolate chips, but I want some. It was great. She found a way to do it. Personally support a missionary. I know you guys already do. The great thing about the Southern Baptist, you are so missional. It's, it's incredible. Um, consider including us in that. Okay, we want to get our support up. I want to do more. 
It's just the way it is. Um, engage in an outreach. Come. Enjoy, enjoy some North African food. Have an omelet at Denny's and learn more. Go outside the Arabic. We, we got your back. We'll be with you all the way. We'll walk you through it. Go. Do that. And if you're really up for it, I have been to the mosque two or three times. I don't have any scars to show for it. So come join me and George. He's a great guy. I'd love to introduce you. In the meantime, I still continue to be under chosen people. I just cover a little bit more territory out here in Phoenix. It has been a joy to be here this morning. Uh, Pastor, do you want to close in prayer? Now, Jeff, I wasn't clear on the date of the conference. Uh, the schedule's back there along with the information. So there are flyers. Okay. It's just for the dinner, we need a head count. Okay. So there's information for contacting George, but we just got to know how many people. And it's at Hillside. He can tell you where Hillside is. Your pastor can. How many of you know where a mosque is in town? Okay. There's one in my community right there in Thunderbird Road and about uh, 23rd Avenue. It popped up one day and it just surprised me. And so every time I drive by that, I do pray. And, uh, you know, it's no problem to go into a mosque on a Friday. But I want to thank Jeff so much. And the charge is simply this. God calls us to himself to birth us and to send us out. We have a story to tell. It's the greatest story ever told. It's your story. It's my story. And it's worth sharing. It's not worth hoarding. And so I just want us to have this time of invitation as we say, come to Jesus just as you are. And as Ellen comes and Gordon leads us, if you need to make a decision to follow God,